Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. I'm Paul Everett, Python developer advocate, and I'll be your host. The topic for today's webinar, a look at and inside textual. And I'm very happy to be joined today by Will McGugan, the creator of Pi File System. Will, does ever, anybody ever ask you about Pi File System anymore? Um, now and again. Yeah, it's been around for a while, though. It's quite an old project, Pi File System. But also, Rich, people ask you about that a lot, right? All the time. All the time. <laughs> and now, because he's so busy with open source, he created another super hot, super sexy, mega popular package called Textual, which will be the topic of today's webinar. Will is busy making Python packages look pretty. Thanks, Will, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, a brief introduction on this, Will, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time on it during kind of an intermission in the middle. You've had a change of job status. Can you explain? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm taking some time off, um, possibly up to a year to focus on my open source work. Um, initially maintaining rich and developing textual, um, but also contributing to lots of other open source projects, just trying to make myself uh, useful in the open source community. Uh, speaking of open source community, hi, everybody in chat. And I will say hi, everybody Ooh. in chat. If you see me looking over, that means I'm looking over at you while I'm trying to look at Will as well. Today's topic is textual Will. What is it? What problem is it solving? And what made you start it? Um, so Textual is a uh, framework for creating TUIs, and a TUI is a text user interface. It's um, essentially a, a user interface that's within a terminal. So when you're working the terminal, it pops up an interface that fills the whole terminal. And it has very familiar things to it, um, you know, scrolling windows, uh, buttons, um, panels, um, et cetera. Um, but then you can exit and go back to the, the terminal again. And I started this because um, I've been developing Rich for like um, well, it's nearly two years now. And some people have wanted to use it for more, more dynamic things because Rich just writes static content to the terminal. And people have wanted to have things which, which respond to key presses and, and mouse buttons and stuff. And I thought, well, I've got a big foundation there. I can take that. I can take Rich and then I can add a text user interface layer onto it and, and design quite uh, beautiful applications with it. And well, that led me down um, a big rabbit hole. Um, it was going to be very simple, just rich plus keyboard control. Um, but it's quickly grown into something that could be quite sophisticated. In fact, um, you have a background in web front end development, right? That's right, yeah. So um, it seems like a lot of your ideas that you've already implemented but then the next set of ideas, which are uh, all of us out here on Twitter, keep reading your tweets thinking, good God, he's doing this in a terminal. <laughs> but a lot of this is informed by CSS, right? That's right. So um, you know, my day job for a number of years has been in web development. And I haven't actually built many applications in the terminal. So I'm taking all my knowledge from web development and see if I can apply it to terminal. And it turns out that there's quite a lot of it can. I mean, a, a lot of CSS, a lot of web development, HTML, um, sort of JavaScript frameworks can be applied to the terminal and and used in much the same way, um, almost almost ver verbatim, because there's been a lot of work done um, for applications in the web browser over you know last ten years has been you know volumes of work. We've learned so much about how to build interfaces. Um, but in the terminal, we're still using uh, very old technologies, like 10 plus years old, e even older than that. Um, so I want to take all this newfangled stuff and see what I can pick and choose uh, and apply it to the terminal. And some of it has been successful and some of it hasn't. Uh, but I think there's still stuff left that I can take mm -hmm. uh, from the web world um, and apply it to the terminal. We'll show some of it, but it isn't just uh, technologies to apply. It's just kind of, it's also wisdom and mindset. Um, people, there are some old people in Python 
not naming any names. But me personally, my idea of what was feasible in a terminal is like 20 years old. I see your stuff yeah. and it never occurred to me that a mouse over a vent could be fired in a terminal. Yeah, there's been um, a terminal can do quite a lot of things. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of functionality built, built into there. And also the terminals are getting faster. They use um, graphics technology, the same type of technology they use for video games um, is used to render characters in your terminal. Um, so it, it can throw quite a lot of characters at your at your screen. And it turns out from some exper experimentation, I could easily do 60 frames a second uh, in the terminal, which uh, seems bizarre to even use the term <laughs> frames per second um, in a terminal. Um, but it can. I mean, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and so I can do I can do smooth scrolling uh, things, which um, I don't see very often in, yeah. in, in the terminal. Just um, to get people oriented right, there was a question right now in the chat about can we use uh, the React framework for coding UIs? This isn't JavaScript. This is mm. Python, mm. but it's informed by a lot of the ideas that you took from working in the web and JavaScript frameworks, right? Yeah, so um, I've used Vue quite a lot, um, which mm. is um, similar to, to React, has some similar ideas. And I've taken that that whole idea of things being reactive and, and seeing what I can do in the terminal. And there's work to be done yet, but it's definitely feasible. Yep. Mm. We will take a look <laughs> at reactive in a bit. Okay, with that background um, in place, let's have some fun. Uh, <laughs> the first question is... Um, about questions, we're already taking questions. Hey, Carlton, I see you just popping up. We're already taking questions in the chat. We'd like to make this as conversational and live as possible. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask it. I'll do my best to keep an eye on it uh, and answer questions either as they come up or we'll pause in between demos and take things from the YouTube chat. So please feel free to ask whenever you want to wait till the end. We'll have some pauses after each demo. We'll have this intermission section where we um, kind of have to chat about some of the things Will's doing. And then we're going to come back and deep, do a deep dive into some of the coding techniques, such as the reactive thing Will was just talking about. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask it. Always the first question. I joke about this. This is my five trillionth webinar. And I've done this same joke five trillion times in a row. I will only stop when it stops working. In three minutes, someone's going to ask, is this thing being recorded? So yes, it's being recorded. It will be published essentially immediately, but we'll also in a couple of days put on our blog post uh, to give you an easy link to it. Uh, now that we've got this all set, let's begin with the first demo. Switch over to my screen. Um, before we get into some of these demos, I'd like to kind of set the expectations a little bit. Will, I think it's safe to say these are early days for textual. Things are changing a lot and not everything is there, such as Windows. Does that sound about right? Um, yeah, Windows support, yeah, but don't have Windows support yet. But there is um, a driver system, so eventually there will be a driver for Windows. Uh, but for right now, Linux and Mac OS. Great. All right, and we have a question about focus switching from the keyboard. When can we expect it? <laughs> That's what I'm working on at the moment, actually. Um, I'm implementing a kind of a, an outline effect. Um, so it'll draw a, a green outline idea as you press something <laughs> like Alt and Tab and you'll see a green outline around the thing that's focused, and then you tab again, and it'll move to the next one, and, da -da 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 -da, yeah. and then cycle through it. Um, hey, so yeah, let, that's- Let's replay that whole thing. Uh, Bill, um, Will's willing to start work on this if he gets some sponsorship for that feature. <laughs> that's what we should have said. And then the sponsorship comes in and you publish the thing immediately. Um, but yes, there are things that are still coming, but I see in chat, there are several people saying they're going to write doom in textual. What do you think of that? <laughs> I think uh, once you can, um, what, run doom on something, then, then, you know, it's ready. For it's arrived. <laughs> it's not yeah. crazy. It would be possible actually. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. If you can run it on the MacBook Pro Touch Bar, then you can run it in, in textual. So quite possible. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the first demo. Uh, this is a little bit kind of like a Hello World app. Um, I'm going to run it in. Uh, let me get the terminal. So I should have done this earlier. I'm going to run it in PyCharm. PyCharm runs these things okay, but they have a little bit of artifacts because we don't have a completely high fidelity terminal. But I'll run most of the things in PyCharm so that we can step through code. I'm going to go ahead and run this. And you'll see it appears on the right. And uh, as I press a key, uh, I should actually, let me start. This is the line that runs everything. Run is a method of the class color changer. Color changer is a subclass of app. So run comes from app and we could navigate to it and see our way around and see it's a class method, interestingly enough. It's not an instance method, um, which gets into an interesting point about where the app instance is gettable from. And then once the app is run, uh, Will, this is an async IO kind of run. Is that correct? Um, that's right. Yeah, it's all async I/O under, under the hood. Um, we don't see any async and await there, but um, it it can run with async and await. Right. Yeah. Yep. So it goes into the event loop from async I/O, and it's got a listener for a key press. So if I come over here and I press a key, let's say I press the key K. Is anything going to fire? Nothing happens. But if I press the key one, I will change colors. If I press the key two, I will change colors, et cetera. Because I'm getting into this event handler and it's uh, what is available on the event. Uh, it is a type of something called a key. So what that means is I can autocomplete. And key is actually a string. So is digit is a standard Python method on a string that says, is this value a digit? And if so, we're going to set the background color. Now, we're getting into the Zen of textual. Why in the world is assigning a value to a instance attribute causing a redraw and a color change. Will, you want to talk about that? Sure. Okay. So um, background is a reactive attribute. Um, and all you have to do is assign to it. You assign a style. Um, so in that example, you'll sign um, on means set the background. Color uh, takes a, a number uh, for the, the color you want. It's red is one, I think. Um, and just the act of assigning it, we'll, we'll do the do the refresh because there's um we'll go into the system later, but that's the the basic idea. You update the state, and then the UI will refresh uh, accordingly, and that makes for some sort of very simple um, development. You don't have to do um, get view dot set background blah blah blah, and then self dot view dot refresh. It's just simply um, you set the background, and then everything will update accordingly. Uh, a question for the audience. How many of you in chat have a background in things like React or Vue or other systems that have this reactive programming style where you state, change some state and later in the render cycle, things get updated? Let's see if we, we have uh, some answers on that. Uh, last question on this. Well, we have filled in an implementation of one handler in the possible event handlers. What are some other examples of event handlers? Um, oh, there's, there's quite a few. <clears throat> um, you've got mouse move. Um, so every time you, if you move the mouse, uh, you'll get updated coordinates. Um, you've got enter. So when the mouse moves uh, from a widget onto another widget, you'll get an enter and you'll get a corresponding leave. Um, so each widget knows when the mouse cursor is moved off of it and when the mouse cursor has moved onto it. And there's also events like um, resize. So if you resize the window, um, all the widgets inside it, the components, 
uh, they will be resized and then they get a resize event uh, to, to inform them of their, their new size. And there's also, you can also have uh, custom events. So um, most events I've talked about are issued by the application itself, by Textual. But you might also want to send events from one widget to another widget. And that uses exactly the same system. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot of events. There's a little bit of discussion in chat about some other systems. And Johan says uh, this kind of stuff is really verbose in other TUI packages. Textual is light years ahead here. I'll get back to the verbose part in a second. There is also another point. I apologize. I forgot to show you the secret little checkbox in PyCharm to get things to lay out correctly in console mode. When you have a run configuration, edit your run configuration and do this checkbox so that in the run tool windows output, it pretends to be a terminal. The reason for this is kind of, uh, you know, we're reading the kind of streaming output from your Python process to do cute and interesting things like link to lines and tracebacks. So um, we don't play, normally we don't play by all the rules of a kind of curses model. Uh, to finish up on Will's point about on key, let me see if I can do autocomplete. Will, do you think I can do autocomplete here? Um, maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, yes, you oh, can, can because okay, you actually have app as a method, which huh. I believe, or message pump, one of them has uh, a lot of these things filled in. So app has. Yep, on key right there. So hmm. we were overriding a built-in event. That might not work for all the events because they are right. issued um, dynamically. So you might not have uh, yeah, the method in the base class. Okay, uh, I will stop there. Actually, one last thing, Will, you mentioned about Reflow, right? Yeah. This is something blew my mind. This isn't the best example to show up, but I'll go ahead and do it. And it re redraws. You see, the, the I'll go really narrow. Watch the right-hand column. It's resetting its width because it's getting, I presume you were saying it's getting an event, right? That's right. I'll get a resize event, uh, and then it will lay everything out and uh, yep. refresh the screen, yeah. Okay, we have a couple of questions. You up for a couple of questions? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. Um, what's the relation between a textual widget and a rich renderable? This is from Carlton. Oh, um, so the widget um, handles all the events and things and the dynamic stuff. Uh, the rich renderable is literally how it draws to the screen. Um, so un under the hood, um, the, the widget will have a render method and that will return uh, a renderable which um, just draws it on, on the screen. So basically, widget for the dynamic stuff, uh, rich for the, the static drawing to the screen stuff. If that makes Carlton, sense. Carlton, if I don't talk too much, we'll actually show a demo of a custom widget, and I think it will make uh, Will's point uh, correct, very clear. We have a question from Or Carmi. I have a question about the handlers. Could you elaborate on the decision? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I did a video talking about this and I was on Python Bytes talking about Will's use of magic. Hmm. The use of specific names as opposed to decorators. Yeah. Um, so a more, I guess, standard approach to, to these uh, event handlers would be to have a decorator. The decorator might be called handler. So you might have at handler and then in brackets, the event. Uh, and that would be quite recognizable to Python developers. Mm -hmm. um, but what, I think I did actually start down that path. But what I realized is um, if you've got a, a key event, um, you're probably going to call it on key. In fact, I can't think of any reason why you would call it anything other than on key. And the, the, you know, the name contains as much as textual needs to know. On key implies it is a, a key event. So maybe I could just use that to... Yeah you know, to 
catch catch the event. And that's that's less code, uh, less boilerplate. I, I don't like um, boilerplate uh, in code. And by boilerplate, I mean um, any character or sequence of characters which is for the machine and doesn't express what the developer's intent is. So I think um, def on key is absolutely enough to um, express the intent, what I want from it. So that's why I went down that route. And I, I acknowledge it is, it is magic, but I think for a framework, you've got a nice um, distinction between uh, the framework uh, and your code. And in that boundary, you can get away with magic um, because it is kind of a, a black box. I mean, I would actually encourage people to, to look at the code, um, but when you're developing applications, um, hopefully it's done so well that you don't have to worry about the magic that's happened uh, to get to that point. Um, it's just from then on, it's just, it's your code. And, Some uh, other things you did, and Will, uh, there was a tweet, uh, Twitter thread, probably around three weeks ago, where Will talked about boilerplate removal and had a whole bunch of side by side and solicited opinions. And you did some other things like there's a question about um, is this async? Why do I not have async in front? Because you make for some things it's optional. You will detect mm. whether it was prefaced with async. You also make it optional to have like here on this next, next example, I could have provided an event, but I don't need the event. Mm -hmm. In other systems, I would have had to say event because it's going to be passed to me. But you mm -hmm. actually sniff at the signature to see what it wants. That's right. I mean, I guess um, that was influenced by the fact that JavaScript is is like that. It's more forgiving. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the async method, it'll just be called as a regular method. And if you don't put the uh, the parameter in the signature, then it'll just doesn't doesn't care much about it. And um, I know that's not familiar to Python developers. Um, you might you know you might be surprised at that. But again, that's um, that's boilerplate. If I don't await anything, then the yep. async is boilerplate. It's like yep. um, it, I have to write it, um, but it doesn't really express my intent as a developer. And also, um, if, if I don't need the event, um, I would still have to type event. And so having to type that is, to my mind, boilerplate. Yeah. And I wouldn't approve of that in anywhere else, actually. If I saw that in a code review, I'd, I'd give it a frowny. <laughs> um, you know, but, but when you've got a framework and, and the boundary is very clear between the magic and your code, um, I think it's excusable. Um, I agree. And I, I, I very I much agree. Yeah. And, um, that, that gets right on the edge of dependency injection, but I think you've done it in a way that's simple and obvious. Let's go through rapid fire round of questions and answers so we can get back to demos. Um, uh, how will ty type completion, this is from Tushar, how will type completion work with runtime methods? I think the answer is it won't. Um, can you expand, not expand on that? What, sorry, runtime? How will type completion work with runtime methods? I, I guess custom methods. Uh, static analysis can't get to that, right? Um, oh, um, yeah. It um, Well, because it's, it's the framework that calls these methods uh, you never call them directly. Um, so again, you just have to rely on on textual um, just working up to that point. Uh, but once you're in the method, um, mm -hmm. then uh, my pine stuff can can work with what it's got. I will well. note that um, that was one of my first surprises. Will uh, said, I'm doing magic and it works with my pie, which immediately got my attention. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of of typing. Uh, my yeah. pie and any any tools like that which can look at your code and, and spot errors before you do i'm massively sure. in favor of it um so i am very much aware when i'm adding features that i don't want to break any my pie feet my pie stuff but i am surprised at how dynamic um textual is uh, and how well my pie actually manages yeah. to cope with most of it yeah okay would it make sense to have empty methods for the ones that are missing to help auto completion that's right on the edge of an abc which you didn't do for the app class yeah um that's not a bad idea so there's um some of the events and messages you define yourself um so that you wouldn't be able to put them on the base class but you could put the the standard ones the key mouse etc on on the 
on the base class. But you also have the problem that, you know, I've done the, the sniffing where it can be async mm -hmm. or not async. If I put if I put it on the base class, if I put an async on the base class, um, my pi, I think my pi will complain complain if it's not async or on on ah. your class. So I think that might be a problem. I mean, it it's a good idea, and I would like to like make it more auto completable so that um, you don't have to look anything up, and when you type, it'll sure. give you suggestions. Sure. Um, so I'm going to look into that, but it is something that is quite dynamic, so it might not completely be able to work with that level of tooling. For the record, you have something that uses protocol, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a big, um, I like protocols over classic inheritance. Yeah. Um, you know that whole um, is a relationship and um, right. and all, the, all that kind of that hierarchy and, and diamond inheritance and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather not think about it and I'd rather not ask um, people using textual to have to think about it. Yeah. Um, is so te is uh, textual asynchronous? Does it use async await? It does. Yeah. Um, so under the hood, when you do run, it'll launch uh, async IO. It'll run it in a task. And actually, yeah. every every widget, every component um, is an async IO task that's running an event loop. Uh, Tushar, we will get into renderable equal view widget equal controller later. Paul McGuire asks if there's any compiled or Cython code, any compiled C code or Cython. There's not, not at the moment. Um, I do plan to do that um, because um, I would, I want Textual to run on quite low powered computers, the type of things that you might run things in a, in a terminal with. Um, my base will be like um, the lowest powered Raspberry Pi. If it works in Raspberry Pi, then it's fast right. enough. If it's not, and I suspect, I expect it won't be, or it could use a bit more optimization. Um, I'll look into um, Cythonizing some of the critical path code, which is probably the render code, the code which is um, You're at calculating the ANSI code. 60 itself. frames per second right now. It's the last yeah. thing you need. Yeah. It actually runs at 120 frames per second <laughs> um, on my MacBook, but um, I don't right. want to require a MacBook to run it. So I am sure. going to look at optimization uh, eventually. But so far, um, it runs pretty well. All right, and then last one, there's some more questions, but I'll do the last one for now. Henry points out on key is a special name, a magic string. Henry, I agree. That was the thing that I had a tough time with. Um, and so far, I've been okay with it, even though in like the last 20 years of my Zope pyramid, et cetera, existence, I've not liked that. Uh, so far, I think the choice is pretty good in this case. Okay, onward. Let's go to another example. And this is one that uses a widget, which brings in some machinery. And what this one's going to do is when I run it, I get a placeholder. Watch at home what happens when I mouse over it. <laughs> mouse. Focus, terminal, are you kidding me? <laughs> how can this be, how can this be possible? Uh, before we dive into everything that's happening in this app, Will, when you started Textual, did you know mouse over was possible? Um, I, I did actually, because um, from HTOP, um, you, you know HTOP, which um, shows you your processes and things. Um, I noticed you could click things with a mouse. Um, so I thought terminals must support mouse control. So obviously I, I looked into it and you can switch the terminal into a specific mode, which means it will send um, mouse uh, events through standard input, which you parse and turn into coordinates. So yeah, I, I was um, knew it was possible and uh, yeah, added it to textual um i don't want textual to be um mouse only though i want it to be a uh, keyboard first um uh -huh. mouse should be like a, an adjunct something to make it a bit easier a bit more um accessible to explore um, but it will be um uh, definitely keyboard oriented eventually okay let's die let's pick this apart a little bit i'm actually going to start at the bottom this line as a keyword argument to run, 
generates this handy little thing. I've got tail minus F on this. So that as stuff happens, I have something to look at, which tells me the framework side that's in talking to your app is able to log copiously stuff about what's going on. Is that a correct way to put it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the problem with debugging text user interfaces is you can't just write stuff to the terminal um, because obviously the logs would just cover all the, the application. Um, so I have um, a log file which you can enable there, log equals textual.log. And you probably mm -hmm. want to enable that for everything. And you can tail that log um, in another window, in another terminal. And it will show you the, the events. So any event which is sent, like a key mouse etc it will write that to yeah. to the terminal and you can uh, you can debug that way yeah uh what i do for debugging i'll go ahead and show that now we'll do a much bigger example of it later is set a breakpoint. this is actually how i went on my exploration i recorded two videos that i um, tweeted out about a look inside the code and that was the way i went on my learning journey of textual I ran this under the debugger and it stops on this breakpoint and I can go backwards into the framework and look, how did I get called? And along the way, what is all the stuff? What's all the state at each point? So for example, it needed to get a callback. What callback was it? It was simple app dot on mount. So this is where the sniffing happened. Um, and it, call, it actually called that method, got a result. And here is the little thing Will was talking about. You didn't have to put, <coughs> we did. Here we put async on it. But if you didn't, it would go and await it for you. No, I'm sorry. If you did, it would await it for you. If you didn't, it would just call it. Hmm. So I, I just kept walking up, walking up, and seeing all the things that got to like the innermost loop. So from a debugger perspective in an application like Textual is a really helpful way to discover things. Back to the demo. Um, well, this is a like a life cycle event. This isn't necessary. I mean, it's an event handler, and we could ask for an event. I suspect, but this is something that happens at startup, right? And so anybody who's comes from a world of React and React components understands lifecycle methods. Is that right? Um, yeah, that's right. Um, so the the on mount event is the first event that gets shown uh, when the, you go into terminal mode. Um, there's also a load event which happens before you get to terminal mode. So the load event you'd use to load configuration and things. Uh, but when on mount, on mount is called, you've got like the full screen terminal mode uh, available. So for example, I could probably learn more about on mount by searching for, um, let's see, in the examples, uh in i'm wonder if they if it's on app might be in is it in the message pump maybe um be on applications so it'll be in the, in the examples uh, app okay. on that right. okay so um now on to the one that's really important what's a view why do um, i need it? I've used a specific kind of a widget. Um, a widget is like a, a visual component, and a view contains uh, other widgets. So it's used to arrange uh, widgets, and, and there's different um, layout schemes. You know, you can put them in a in a box, or you can dock things. Um, but the, the default is um yeah, there a dock view which allows you to um, dock. And by dock, I mean take a widget and move it to one side of the screen with a given given number of characters. All right. So uh, my app has a instance attribute called view, which is really a property. And yeah. you could you could replace it with a different kind of view instead of the out of the box stock view. Is that right? Um, the 
app contains just goes with the dock view. But if you wanted a different kind of view, you could dock that other view. So you might have okay, a, a grid view, which you could dock into the application and have it fill the okay. whole thing. All right. Then what we're doing is we're docking a placeholder. Docking is kind of a layout concept, uh, which people who might have used TKN or something like that in packing might understand a little bit about. And then placeholder is a widget. Mm -hmm. So this gets into discussions about widgets and out-of-the-box widgets and how they get docked. Can you talk about that real quick? Um, so uh, placeholder is um, to be used when you haven't implemented the widget yet, but you want to see how it would arrange in the screen. And um, that will handle, uh, when, you, when you dock it, it starts uh, an event loop. So it starts an async IO task, which is um, processing events. Uh, and that will receive key events and and on mount and all the other events that we've uh, talked about. Yeah, I think of it. I, I don't know why, but it it smells a little bit to me like when I'm using CSS. I know what the hell is going on? So I put borders everywhere. Yeah, and then I can see the layout of everything. And placeholder kind of makes me think of or it. Kind of reminds me of that. It's like, where are my boxes? Oh, okay, there's my boxes. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much exactly like that. Um. So, so you can design your application before you've implemented all your widgets. Here is a better example where we have actually three placeholders. I wonder if it's because I don't have enough room. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Reflow, how about that? So this is the first line is docked with the edge on the left and given a size. And then we dock two placeholders so the art doc can accept more than one argument uh, more than one positional argument and then a set of keyword arguments and these are docked to the top and then flow top to bottom is that right that's right yeah all right great we will uh pause there and take some questions because we're really backed up on questions um okay <coughs> is it uh, carlton asks is there a runtime cost to the introspection? Um, there is, yeah. Um, so if you do, is it waitable? Um, there is a little bit of extra work there. Um, it's fairly negligible, I think. Um, I think I do cache it. If I'm not, I, I could do. So I only have to do, is it waitable once uh, for every time, you know, the first time you access it. Um, so I think... Yes, there is, but it wouldn't have any impact, really. Yeah. Uh, it, it would be interesting if you do go into more sniffing. Um, I have a system uh, that I've been working on for a while that has some similar ideas. And at startup time, I sniff everything and turn them into named tuples so that I don't have to sniff them ever again. Yeah, you can do it in, in advance or, or or cache it exactly. Yeah. So um, there is a very small runtime penalty, but you can sure. make that disappear yeah. via caching. We will stumble, Carlton. We will stumble across some other optimization things Will does to kind of store cached information about the last value on certain things, so that things that really haven't changed don't have to recompute. Um, okay. Is the placeholder being rendered through something built into rich? Uh, yeah. Um, so the placeholder is, is a rich renderable. Um, it's a panel, which has got, um, a pretty, pretty is an object, which pretty prints, um, a regular Python object. Um, so yeah, you can render exactly the same thing, uh, in rich outside of textual. Carlton also asks one event loop per widget. Why rather than a shared loop? Um, it's so they can work independently. Um, they can uh, each widget can update its only its portion of the screen uh, and respond to its own events and do it at its its particular um, schedule. And it can handle its its own lifespan, etc. Um, the actual running to the screen. Um, is done through the app, and that makes sure that everything um, is done in a very logical order uh, so that nothing tries to overwrite each other and stuff. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, event loop per widget um, is quite familiar if you're using uh, JavaScript, I think. Uh, JavaScript frameworks kind of work like that. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go on to a next demo. If you have any more questions, uh, fire them up. I'll get to them after this. Will, we're going to try and speed up a little bit. I'm going to throw you a curveball because this one doesn't actually work correctly. Oh, it's, okay. It, it's also, I mean, it's not PyCharm console related. It's also in the uh, regular terminal. Um, but still, it's very useful to talk about because of our friend Reactive. Okay, so I'm going to run this. And that was not supposed, that wasn't the, I wonder if I, there's nothing in my code that did that. Um, I did release an update like two days ago. Um, I could very well have broken you feel, it. You feeling brave? <laughs> um, oh, okay. Yeah, go for it. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Any dependencies change or anything? No, just um, a small code update. All right. Okay. Can't believe I'm. <laughs> All right, we'll skip it. Oh. We'll just talk our way through it. Mm. This is an example of an app with a custom widget. At the mount portion of the life cycle, and we'll just talked about there's a load event in the bootstrapping. There's kind of a mount phase as well. In the mount phase, we're going to get a list of hoverables, in this case, 10 of them, and we're going to dock all 10 of them to the top. What is a hover? It is a widget. So it subclasses from a mostly already made thing that has a renderable or method render, which says it will return a panel. And then the panel has some text it wants to display and some styling. That's what I really wanted to show is um, this connection to here. Let me see if it's, let me just confirm that it's a, it's poetry. I'll skip that. That when you mouse over just this widget, and what Will, you were just saying is because it's not one big event loop and things have kind of their local part of the tree or whatever, you know when you have the focus. And when you have the focus, when or when you're moused over, this value will change. And then in the next render loop, which happens 120 times a second, we're going to change our color. Is that the right way to put it? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. And how do we assign this value? We just have an event. When the mouse enters, when the mouse leaves, we change this value. How in the world does this work? Reactive is a Python descriptor which is a magical frameworky thing like meta classes and some other things in python and when you make actually well is this this is a class attribute not an instance attribute is that right um it creates an in, uh, instance attribute that's it how it, so it's bound it, so. to each each <clears throat> instance of hover so all of these yep. all 10 of these have a separate instance of reactive is that right um so, so once the magic kicks in that this is done at the python level um the instance will have uh, a mouse over a separate mouse over for each of the hovers yeah and what it lets you do is intercept the setting and getting of an attribute value and then will bakes a whole bunch of smart textual logic behind this you don't have to think about it and then later uh python and textual call you they gather up everything that's needed everything that's available in scope and they call you 
with things like the message target, um, it, the value that's actually being passed, we can actually get, if we need to, we can get to the running app. Uh, but this is the stuff in the Python descriptor. The Python descriptor protocol says um, your descriptor can have a get and a set, but can also have a thing called a set name. Will, can you explain the difference between set and set name? Um, set name is called uh, when Python gives the attribute a name. So that's so the descriptor will know what the, the name of the thing is you're, you're creating, uh, which I need um, internally. And so and, take uh, a look at the magic that happens. I say magic. This isn't, I mean, what was that, 20 lines of code? This is not crazy. And this is a normal thing that's been in Python since Python 2.2 or something, descriptors. When I make this assignment, it is triggering this. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. And look at the kinds of things Will now is able to do in the background. He's going to see if the, well, there was a value a second ago. Let's go get that to see if it's actually changed. But as it changed, I'm not going to do any of this stuff. Maybe there is with Will's kind of special naming thing, maybe there's a validator function that needs to run on this widget. So in this case, Will, what would the name of the method be for mouse over? Validate underscore mouse over. And it would be past an event? No, past the, the value. Um, if you give it one value, then it'll get the new value. Okay. If you have two parameters, then you'll get the old value plus the new value. All right. And um, it will, so it'll validate it. It'll run that function to see if an exception is raised or something. And then it will check the value and then do the magic. This is the reactive system. And this is where it says, who is watching this value? Who wants to be told when it changes? Yeah, that absolutely. is really cool for a way of programming. I'll jump into that. And check watchers is actually a class method, so it needs to be passed in its information. And we'll have some policy for going to look for watchers. Watchers also have a watch under variable name. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, same, same notion, um, yep. convention over configuration. So if you want to watch foo, it's watch underscore foo. I mean, why would it be named anything else? All right. Henry points out correctly that the set name was a pep that was in some Python three, five or three, six or something. Descriptors themselves are pretty old. Yeah. Good so this there. this whole idea of um, a value actually changes, and when we say change, I didn't have to call check watchers. I just assigned a value, and stuff happened in the background. And in the background, it does a bunch of smart things like how do I refresh, how do I repaint, all that other stuff. It's all part of Textual's framework. Will, you got anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so the um, the refresh doesn't happen instantly. Right. Um, and I know we're calling object.refresh there, but what ha actually happens is it sets a flag that says um, this object needs to be refreshed. And then once, um, once the widget is processed, all the events, um, it'll check that flag, and if it needs to refresh, then it will paint the screen. And the benefit of that is... Um, first of all, if you're doing a lot of work and you've modified several attributes which require a refresh, uh, you only get one refresh because it, you only need a single refresh to repaint the screen. You don't want to refresh uh, 10 times. So, um, uh, if People who have any background with React know the whole render loop thing is very similar. You don't actually render. You just say to the system, next time you, the next clock tick or whatever, comes around, here's something to do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm going to stop here, go through some questions, and then we will do, um, we will skip the next two demos, go to the intermezzo quickly, and then do some inside the code because we're behind a lot.
I knew I would be. I knew I would be. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you need an async generator there instead of a non-async one, perhaps? And I think Henry must be talking about this. Um, no, no, that's um, that's just constructing it. So that bit doesn't need to be uh, async. That creates a, a generator of of um, hovers which are constructed. Uh, Henry, let me know if I was pointing at the correct or the incorrect uh, name. Tushar <laughs> asks how he can help with textual. Guess what? That is part of the intermission. So if you could put both of us back on screen uh, side by side and uh, get rid of my screen temporarily. We'll spend a couple of minutes talking about um, some things about his sponsorship model. All right, great. Okay, everyone in chat, listen up on this part. <clears throat> this is how you can help, multiple ways you can help. Uh, Will has changed to a model where he is doing open source development and he's using GitHub sponsorship. Is that correct? Um, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm trialing that. I've got some sponsors already, uh, mostly from, from Rich, um, which is yep. very much appreciated. Yep. Uh, I signed up for a monthly sponsorship, not as much money as you deserve, but it's a start. Uh, and I was doing it for textual, not rich. I haven't really jumped into rich yet. So with GitHub sponsorship, you can do one time or recurring. Will, is that correct? Um, that's right. Yeah, you can do uh, one time if you just want to say thanks for a bug fix or something. Um, or recurring if you would like to support my work uh, going forward. Yep. And kind of give your your thinking about... Um, you know, why you've made this change, go into a little bit more depth about why you've made this change, what you hope to prove, not just for yourself, but maybe as kind of a generic example that this could work. Um, so I've made this change, well, for kind of uh, multiple reasons. Um, some of it to do with the, the work itself, some of it um, sort of personal reasons, et cetera. Um, but basically, well, I've, I've always enjoyed work in open source and I've worked I've done a lot of work over over uh, 10 plus years of, for for other people uh, which I do for free gladly because um, I enjoy it and I want to take the opportunity to just do that full time uh, people seem to really appreciate rich and now they're quite excited about textual and I'm excited about it and I would like to um, do it justice um, I've been doing this stuff um, part time and there's some things you, you just really need to have um solid time on you know yeah. weeks and days to do it justice um having looked at the outstanding tasks for textual uh, it's quite daunting there is um uh, quite a lot of it and it'll yeah. take quite some time so i would like yeah. to um devote quite a lot of time to it and um full disclosure i do think there will be some commercial applications for textual um yep. those will be quite far down the line once it's in a, a more complete state and it's um got all the features you need and all the documentation um so i think the next three to six months it'll be purely me working on on textual and other open source projects um so it's an exciting opportunity for me to do something that i love and um hopefully help the the community um, I should mention, I did say there'll be commercial applications hopefully down the line, but Texture will always be uh, free and open source. Yep, so, yeah, um, it's actually good for us if you have commercial applications because then that gives you the resources to keep giving us something awesome for free. Yes. Please, everyone, remember, I mean, this has become almost a crisis for open source. We have all become such takers, especially companies. Companies have become such takers that don't really want to give back. Why should I give back when I'm going to get it for free? And then it becomes a tragedy of the commons. Let's use Will as an example and prove that this can work with someone who deserves for it to succeed. Um, Will is not just giving us great code. 
he's actually volunteering his time. You can go to his Calendly, get a 30 minute slot, and he'll review your code without charging you anything. Just as part of his year of open source. So try to give them some money. Try to prove that this can work so that other similar things can work. If you can't give money, there are things in Textual that Will has identified, I believe, as good starter tickets. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I've added some um, tickets which um, someone who's not that familiar with Textual could, could pick up and contribute to. And I will be adding more of those in the future, and I'm happy to um, mentor anyone who wants to get started. Hmm. And um, you've got so, a label on them, right? Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It might be good first issue or um, it stands help, wanted. help wanted. Help wanted, right. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So if you go to github.com slash Will McGugan slash textual slash issues, you will see a list of issues, an already daunting list of issues. And uh, some of them have these tags on it. Um, mm. If you want to uh, participate, but don't feel comfortable yet on code, Will need has kind of stubs for docs. And so there's some doc stuff that could be done. If you want some deeper level stuff, I suspect Will would like some help getting this working on Windows. Is that right? Uh, yeah, um, I will tackle that eventually. Um, that would be a um a good one to put a help wanted tag on that yeah um yeah. That, that would be interesting it's, it's not that's not an easy one um so that would be mm -hmm. a challenge for you but there um, are some reference examples of similar systems that have some decent windows full screen terminal support yeah yeah so um so definitely there's, prior art. there's lots of other open source out there and you can yeah. um pick some of the features and things uh, i mean um I'm a big fan of Prompt Toolkit. Um, mm. who's, the author's name, uh, I can't remember, is it Jonathan Slenders? Um, apologies if I've got the name wrong, but um, his code has been a big, big help writing textual because mm. I had to figure out all the uh, the terminal magic to to start um, processing mouse events and things. So mm. I, I refer to lots of other open source code. I'm the beneficiary of open source code. So uh, yeah, I, I very much approve of um, people um not stealing because it's not stealing you're giving it away no, um no, no, not, benefiting actually from not at all work. yeah not at all one yeah. last point before we go back to my screen um you also have places where people can chat in last week or this week i think you settled on uh getter is that right oh that's right yeah um getter.im so i needed a, a way to um sort of correspond to people interested in textual um, so we've got GitHub discussions and GitHub issues, uh, but sometimes you want a more kind of real-time sure. conversation. And the, um, I will say the discussions are pretty good. There's a, a good number of topics in there already. The GitHub yeah, discussions. I, I like discussions. Yeah, that they're they're very good for um, sort of um, in-depth technical exchanges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, Sasha, could you switch back to my screen while we take two? <laughs> that was too fast. You're supposed to take more time on that. Well, we take two quick questions. Carlton asks, we'll make this fast. How stable would you say the public API is right now? Carlton, you're not asking that question, <laughs> are you? Um, if by stable, do you mean from version to version? Um, I would say not at all. Um, I'm completely, because <laughs> um, it's a zero point version, same verse says yeah. you can um, break things. So if you're using it, um, pin your version numbers to right down to the last digit because um, I could may change everything next version I'll try it's not to freedom but... time for will right now yeah. freedom to change yep mm. and then uh or asks um a question that i had asked you last week about uh how should textual apps be tested um testing is still something i have to figure out i assume you mean unit tests um i have to figure out um testing with async io i think there's some um developments in the, in the pi test world to do that but how you test um uh applications you've written with textual i've still figured that out um testing is obviously very important um so i'll be doing a lot of work in that but i'm afraid i don't have a definitive answer as yet okay let's do another demo and this time the demo is well let's just say it it's sexy it's actually sexier outside of pycharm so i'll run it outside of pycharm then i'll run inside pycharm 
set the go and use the debugger, set some breakpoints, and poke around in the machinery and see how things work. And then we'll uh, do the conclusion and get out of here. I'm going to do um, my terminal, clear that because that's ugly. Should have tested that this morning. And I want to actually run. Oh. Can you believe it? A desktop calculator in a terminal, which reflows correctly. So if I want to say two plus two, your choice of colors is just appalling. Right. Um, the I contrast think it's, ratio over here, I can't even see what is a plus. So I'll say I think two it's plus because, three. Uh, on my two terminal, plus three equals five. So this is basically the display of the calculator. It's a widget. All these things are widgets. How do they kind of talk to each other? And then how does the display get updated based on the state changes? Let's go take a look. So I'm gonna quit that. Go back to here. So I'm in the calculator app, but it's actually a grid view. What's a grid view? It is a subclass of view, which means somewhere later on down here, uh, it's being docked into an app. So the calculator isn't the app. The calculator is something docked into the view of an app. It is a grid view. Will, should we think of this like CSS grid? It's exactly like CSS grid. Yeah, I've implemented, um, I don't know, about 70% of CSS grid there. So um, let's, let's not think so much about how it looks. Let's instead think of this like a React application with Redux and there's some state that's getting changed and then the UI redraws itself based on that state. So I'll ignore all this, you know, color-y crap and focus instead on these two class attributes display and show AC. Mostly I'm gonna focus on display. That's the thing that shows the current number and it's reactive. It's an instance of reactive with an initial value of zero. Just for fun, let's give an initial value of 10. Come back over here. Will, do you think I will see 10? I'm almost certain you will. No, mm. <laughs> I must set it to zero on 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 mount or something. Okay, all right. Should have checked that before trying that. So uh, actually, I didn't save. I didn't do an explicit save. I counted ah. on PyCharm doing its own save. So that's we'll we'll say that that's my fault for not saving. Um. So what's really happening here? Here's something called display. Aha! Uh -huh. Will with his magic naming service has something called watch under display with a dot string, which tells you exactly what's happening. Whenever this changes, this is executed. So when might this be changed? There you go, there's an assignment. There's an assignment, all these assignments. So what I want to do is I want to see how Will is doing this. So I'm going to go into the system itself, and I'm going to go into, let's see, set under name. I'm going to put a breakpoint in here. I'm just going to walk through it a little bit. I'm going to uh, run this under the debugger. Um, the, it would actually be in here that it's starting to fire itself up. But I've stopped here, and the name of the thing is visible. Well, that's one of Will's things. That's not my thing. So I don't want to really stop here, and I don't want to press go, 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 go 100 times. So I'm going to change this to say name equal display. 
I'm going to say, hey, debugger, keep going. Now I'm on my thing. Then now this is where the Python descriptor protocol is actually doing its thing for set name on my thing. And let's take a look at this specifically. Let's see what is owner. Owner is calculator, the grid view. This is the thing that blows my mind about descriptors is I can get back to the thing it's bound to. Ordinarily, I wouldn't be able to. It's just an instance and scope. I'm out of the scope now. I can't get back to the class or instance that I'm bound to. But question for you in the audience, am I bound to the class or the instance? I'll give you a hint. So, Will, tell the audience the answer. Um, Owner is the class of calculator or the instance of calculator? Um, it's the class, I believe. Correct. All right. As I step over this stuff, I just, uh, none of this was true because there wasn't a magic method compute under display. We just had watch under display. If there was a compute under display, this is badass. Will will let you have like dynamic calculated values that are stored on the object. So that once they're stashed, they aren't, sta they aren't stashed again, I guess, until they change or something like that. All right. So I skipped over all that. And now I'm going to do that little dance where I've got the name and the fake name so that I can disambiguate them. I'm going to store the internal name, this. So this will be self dot under under display. Is that right? That's right, yeah. I'm going to store it on the owner. And that's all pretty cool. So I'm going to go down a little further and set a breakpoint here and continue. And this is one of the first assignments. And I am on, uh, let's see, the object is the instance of, is a reactable. Well, that's different than reactive. So, Will, what's reactable? Um, that's the type. Um, actually, I believe, a, a, yeah, um, the type that can have reactive attributes, which is widgets or, or an app. Right. So that kind of gives you an idea of the scoping rules for reactivity, that they are within a widget or within the entire app. But you can't have a widget watching another widget's values. Is that correct? Um, via the reactive descriptor? Uh, no. Yeah. Yep. Which actually lends to the simplicity of it meaning I don't have to make a decorator to watch something. I just, on the thing that's being defined, I put a special method. Yeah, I think there is actually, there's a watch method, um, which you can watch um, another object's uh, reactive value. Um, but the reactive descriptor, um, it's only for um, the attribute on that same yep. object. So a similar kind of thing, we're going to, in the process of setting this value, we're going to see if there is a previous value. We're going to see if there's a validate function. We're going to validate if necessary, if the value has actually changed. And in this case, I think it has. Yep. We're going to go in and we're going to fire all the watchers. Same thing we saw before. All right. Uh, will, we will stop there on demos and stuff. There's a lot more machinery in here. We looked at compute. We looked at watchers. There's the message pump for the event model. Um, just at a high level, can you think of a couple of other things people might be interested in the architecture? Um, that's most of the interesting stuff, actually. The um, the, the message pump, uh, watchers. Um, I'm sure there is, but I can't think of any <laughs> at the moment. Uh, we will do a couple more questions uh, on the way to wrapping up. If we could go ahead and switch to having Will and me side by side. Okay. 
a couple of comments from people saying that it's actually my fault for having a white terminal. Otherwise, the contrast in the calculator would have been just fine. <laughs> it's not it's not your fault exactly. Um, I think uh, <laughs> next time I'll explicitly set the background um, to, to black. As Johan says, it's a self-inflicted wound by me. <laughs> Uh, Tushar points out as if the descriptors weren't enough, you can magically create an arbitrary number of descriptors. Holy mother of magic. <laughs> Have you ever seen that in the wild? Um, you can create as many descriptors as you like, really. Um, you I, th I think what Tushar might be saying is, um, dynamically create, programmatically create. Right. All right, and Matthew points out he really liked using Rich's renderable type to indicate an object as a dunder rich or a dunder rich under renderable. Yeah, so um, anything that works in rich can can work in in textual. Um, so you can use existing uh, rich components. Um, there's there's quite a lot of them out there already, but it's also quite easy to to build your own. Uh, Matthew also asked, would TUI developers benefit from setting a color scheme for their apps instead of relying on the ANSI color codes? Uh, I yes. This is going to be part of your CSS ideas. Yeah, uh, um, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of benefits um, in, in setting your own color scheme. Um, I want in the future to do things like fades, um, but you can't do fades uh, with the ANSI color scheme because you, as a um, textual can't know what color you're getting. Um, the first 16 colors, I don't know if you guys know this, um, you can ask for red, but you know, you might not get red or you might not get the exact same shade of red. So if you want to do a fade, you can't tell what the starting point is. Um, so if you set a color theme to begin with, um, then you'll be able to do like nice fades, uh, possibly cross fades, things like that. And in the future, we'll have uh, CSS and textual uh, and that will allow you to modify not just the colors, but um, also things like um, margin and padding and, and border uh, and all that good stuff. Yes, Will means that he actually is going to have the equivalent of a CSS file with CSS syntax instead of having to do things in Python. Yep, quite a lot can be done um, in, in CSS. Quite a lot to be done. Yeah, yeah. you can do things like um, hover effects, you know, and some of the demos. Transition. Yeah, hover effects, transitions, all, all sorts of. Or animation, I should stuff. say. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, now on to the best two words in any presentation. In conclusion, uh, before we wrap up, Will, what's next for Textual? And would you like people to get involved? Um, next thing development-wise is um, CSS. That'll be the next, um, next week or two. Um, I'm going to be parsing CSS and modifying the attributes on, on widgets. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, how to get involved? Uh, lots of ways to get involved. Um, jump in on, on the discussions. If you have ideas, I definitely want to hear about them because obviously I want to hear uh, use cases. What, what do you think you'd want to build with this? Uh, that will influence um, the direction that Textual goes in or jump in on um, Gitter.im um, or yeah, uh, bugs, of course. <laughs> I want to hear about uh, bugs. Um, just con contribute um, in any way that you, you feel that you'd like to. This really is a case where you can just contribute. There's not a whole bunch of warm up needed. It's re it's all even though it's kind of just started, it's well organized code, and there are easy and obvious places to jump in. Yeah, uh, we and, should and right all be now, jumping in because this could yeah. be a cool thing for Python. Yeah, and right now is the best time to uh, jump in because any. You know, you can have quite a big impact. Um, if you have a, a good yes. idea, I'm going to run with yeah. it, and um, more easy, it's more easily implemented uh, near the beginning of the project than it is um, at the end. So, um, yeah, uh, keep it coming. And if any of you are really good at Python, PyTest, Async IO, jump right in, and write some tests. Yeah, tests uh, need to be done. Yeah, that's it's a big yeah. chunk of work. Um, it'll be worth it because. Um, I want textual to be super stable. Uh, Rich is 100% tested, and it's it's yeah. really quite stable now. Um, textual isn't. I think we're still just like um, 5%. Some of the 
Um, the really simple stuff to test, the low-hanging fruit is tested, um, but a lot of the, the more advanced stuff. But because it's it's um, unstable at the moment, it's, it's going through lots of changes, it's hard to test, um, but still uh, going to need a lot more work in the testing going forward. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap up. Will, thanks for joining us for kind of this two for the price of one, both beginner and intermediate uh, tour through Textual. And really just thanks for everything you do for Python. Thanks. It's been great. It's been fun. If you'd like to get more information on PyCharm, please go to our website at jetbrains.com. If you haven't already, please check our PyCharm blog. Lots of stuff starting to happen already. Uh, on our blog, you can find up-to-date information about PyCharm news and releases and events in addition to educational resources such as this webinar. Going to have a good webinar in October. Going to have a good webinar in November. It's going to be a string of good webinars. We'd love your feedback on this webinar. We read the survey. So please contact us on Twitter. Or if you get the email about the survey, fill in the survey. We will take a look at it. I will actually share some of your points with Will if you have any comments for him. Um, and we will send the uh, email to the survey in just a little bit. So that's all from us today. Thank you to our esteemed guest. Thank you to you, our esteemed viewers and participants. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Hope you have a nice day. Thanks, everyone.